Was there a big tide there? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's a tide that, like, fa we had we had already started moving at a good time. Like, the tide wasn't, like, fully... Okay. But yes, it was a moment of, like, real scary. Have you ever been stuck on an island like that? What? I just have told you, ever... you I have. No, like, actually stuck. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. like, did you listen to my story? <laughs> Okay. Hello and welcome to Talking Too Loud with Chris Savage. I am your host, Chris Savage, and I am joined by the one, the only, Sylvie Lubau. Sylvie, how are we? Pretty good, folks. Pretty good over here. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty good there. Um, well, we have a great interview today with Noah Davis, who is the co-founder of 3.4 Media. He's also a freelance writer who's written for tons of brands, New York Times, New Yorker, Washington Post, ESPN, New York Mag, Wired. I'm not going to say them all. Okay, let's just say. <laughs> too many to name. Too, too many, many to name. name. But great interview talking about content strategy, branded content, how to think about building a strategy what's working what's not and we get a little bit into f1 as you know sylvia just I a wee to. bit just a wee bit as i'm apt to get in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh yeah so um should we talk more about f1 now or no you want to get into the <laughs> you're killing me you're I killing me smalls if it was tennis i think you'd be there then all may, day then maybe you'd be I with would me be. non-stop i know i, I should watch drive to survive at least season one. At least, At season, least one. season one. At least okay. season one. I'll do that. Um, what's going on with you, Sylvia? It's been a little while. How are you? I'm good. Uh, want to know what's got me talking too loud? I do want to know that. Yes. Okay. Yes. So last night I went to a show. I talked a little bit about this in the interview just because it came up. Uh, I went to a show at the Bell House and... Um, this is a house where they make bells? How did you know? I just, you know, good name. You're wicked smart. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I went to see a band called Middle Age Dad Jam Band. And um, it's, it's two comedians. I assume it's all like 23 year olds. How did you know again? You're just like, you're killing it. Um, David Wayne and Ken Marino, who are from Wait, the what? state. Yeah. They're from the They're state. They're the two? They're the two. Oh my gosh. I'm Ken very Marino, jealous now. lead singer, David Wayne on the drums. Wow. Okay. And like a bunch of other musicians as well and singers and... Does everyone was... just chant Wet Hot? No, but they did do a song from Wet Hot that was did amazing. They? That's amazing. Um, it was so fun and funny. And I love Ken Marino. He can do no wrong in my eyes. But... um the music was actually good like i was like dang these guys can play that's like, amazing they did a, they did some billy joel mm -hmm. they did some uh oh my god who sings nothing or nothing is nothing you know that song yeah it seems like a song about nothing i don't i don't listen to songs like that it's a good one <laughs> jimmy buffett they did bonnie ray it felt like like going to a karaoke bar and seeing some of your favorite celebs singing that's so cool it that's was so awesome. fun it was so fun what a delight and a sunday night too yeah you don't really get that on a sunday night Not um, usually. what's got you talking too loud over there um, me, uh, let's see. I was just in Maine, which was fun. Oh, talk too loud about Maine. Well, we went to the same little island I've gone to for a few years running called North Haven, Maine. Very hard to get there. There's not very many ferries. So you have to mm. wait in line a long time or get a reservation exactly a month in advance. So I, call, I won't tell you exactly what time to call because you know, you've <laughs> got to keep the spots open. Um, and it is usually very relaxing, very fun. And it was, but just like... I guess the main coast is getting destroyed by fog this year, which I think is related to all the torrential rain that folks have been mm. getting. Um, so while well, normally you sit there and you just look and you see these other beautiful islands and whatever, mostly I just saw a, just nothing. Fog. Yeah, I just saw <laughs> yeah. nothingness. Um, but it was still it was still nice to you know take a little break and recharge and spend time with the fam and stuff. So it was great. Yeah, um, but fog is on my shit list right now. <laughs> uh, because it's just so annoying. There's so much fog. You're driving at night. We were coming. We went out to this one um, dinner, and it was so foggy. Even though there's like one road, we got lost on the way home. 
It was like that's I believe that it. Bad. It I was believe just it. like I'm like, why is that? What is the, where are we? I mean, we've been driving for so long. It's like we're in the literal yeah. wrong spot. There's basically one. I don't know how this could possibly happen. Um, but I've yeah, had was, one epic fog main experience where my family and I, we went to a beach that we always go to called Popham Beach. And at low tide, you can walk out to this island and it's great. And then you walk back. And so we walked out, like hung out up there, climbed the rocks, la, la, la. And then on the way back, we're like, oh, the fog is rolling in. And truly, like, three minutes after we said that, I couldn't see my mom next to me. Like, thank God we just, like, grabbed hands. But, like, it was terrifying. It was and the terrifying. Water's probably, and the, and the, and the tide the, is coming back in, exactly. When the exactly. tide comes back in, in the right spots of May. No, I mean, no, like no, a no, 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 no. Sometimes marketing can be like a thick fog. Thick fog, to, but to get through it, you gotta figure out who is your audience, what do they know, and how do you chart your path through? And with that, let's kick <laughs> it over to the interview with Noah Davis. Noah, so good to see you, man. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is really exciting. Look at us. Noah and I <laughs> know each other for a long time, so to be grown-ups on a podcast is just a really exciting thing in general. You've made it. We usually yeah. communicate on signal about f1 races that's pretty much it so <laughs> there is a lot of that there's a lot of that i mean i don't want to get into it but really i mean exciting <laughs> exciting weekend exactly. uh, <laughs> noah as you know we love to start the show by asking people what's got them talking too loud so what's got you talking too loud so I think it's two things. I also think one is that um, I really never talk too loudly about anything. So it's more like talking <laughs> talking a lot about something, um, but uh, talking passionately maybe. Um, yeah. I, I ran in a very cool race this weekend. And then also I'm very excited about sort of the space uh, work world, like the space that we're in of telling stories uh, feels like a really ex exciting time to be in that space. And I think I can tie those two things together if you Sweet. give me a chance. Yeah. So the first one is this race, and I have run a lot. I ran in high school, ran a little bit in college, um, and have just sort of run throughout my career in, in New York. Uh, and I ran in a race. It's put on by a group called Orchard, Orchard Street Runners, and it's like, it's not underground, but it's kind of a, everyone is very fit and very tattooed, um, and they run at night. And one, oh, of their, wow. one of their signature events is this thing called Hardcore. the Midnight Half Marathon, which starts at midnight and is a half marathon around New York. And they don't have a fixed route. You just have specific points that you have to go to, so checkpoints. And so you can get there any way you want to. And so, you know, I mean, New York is a grid, so there's generally better and worse ways to go. Um, but it's kind of races like that, like that's the ethos. And I didn't run in that, but they had the one this weekend, which ran from the Lower East Side under the Manhattan Bridge to Red Hook, which is in Brooklyn. And there were three checkpoints in Red Hook and then back to under the bridge in, lower, in uh, the Manhattan Bridge. And so I ran it, it was about 10 and a half miles. It was very tiring. Uh, I got my butt kicked by a bunch of young 20 year olds. It was very humbling and, and but very, very, very fun. And it's been cool to see this kind of org, this organization, Orchard Street Runners grow like pretty organically and pretty authentically and pretty naturally. Hmm. And to the point where, you know, there were probably 200, 250 runners who paid 50 bucks to get into this race that was just sort of unsanctioned and you know it's a really nice attitude uh everyone's super excited and like just happy to be there uh great vibes and it, it just feels like the kind of thing that you know it's it's primarily orchard street grows i think through instagram they have a website that doesn't really function very well it doesn't have much information <laughs> and it just kind of has grown through word of mouth and like wonderful Photography. The other thing that's very cool is because there are so many wonderful creative people in New York, like the media around the event is insane. You know, like huh. the Instagram feed is really cool. This guy, Ash Gilberton, is he's, he's the guy who photographs all of the races. Um, he is also a guy who shot for the New York Times. I don't know if you saw, there's a photo of uh, Officer Goodman during the January 6th the insurrection and he's like pointing for trying to get the insurrectionists to go over there. You'd like, you recognize the photo. Okay. And, and Ash took this photo, you know, so like you have this guy who took this probably award-winning photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're during, there for this like, you know, just there race. for this weird thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
and it just feels like a very cool time to like be able to build a community in that way. And I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're doing at 3.4, not to like spin this too hard, but is about building brands and helping tell stories. And I think a lot of the people on the podcast that you've talked to recently have been sort of the marketing space now is much more about building these kind of authentic communities and, um, you know, kind of building your own audience rather than renting them. And a lot of the metrics that used to work don't work anymore. And SEO is kind of broken and breaking down. Yeah. And yeah. It, it just feels like there's so much opportunity now to like be able to build these groups in like little cool ways. And that race just felt like such a good example of that. And was that like, so was this race at night? Was it like it was, another? Yeah. yeah. It started at 8 PM. So is that like, yeah, that seems dark. It seems like also, you know, you <laughs> want to have like a good night's sleep before you go and run a race. Usually did you prepare differently? Were you like, would it throw you off or was it more exciting or like, how was that different from like a morning race? It was definitely, uh, more fun. I think, um, I also, was before I had some friends who were going out to dinner and so I went out to dinner with them and I didn't eat. <laughs> and so I sat, I sat at this really wonderful restaurant um, and watched them eat and then I had to sort of <laughs> sort of walk away. Um, so I, I had no aspirations about winning this or anything. I mean, there actually was, there's a $300 prize for the winner and 200 for second and 100 for first for men, women and non-binary. So it, it's like, it's not, you know, it's not a nothing race. Um, yeah, I was I was not going to win, so I didn't take kind of as seriously as I have in the past um, for other races. I also because you had to run across either the Manhattan Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge was a little shorter, and I ran over the Brooklyn Bridge, which was very silly because running over the Brooklyn Bridge at 8 p.m. on a summer weeknight, oh, where like there are one there. million tourists doing yeah. one million tourist things, totally understandably, yeah. um, really slowed me down. So everyone else had gone over the Manhattan Bridge, so. That was oh, the, wow. the route was a mistake. Um, the value the, of being different. It seems. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I should have gone with the crowd on that one. The yeah. wisdom of the crowd is correct. Um, so I do want to get deeper into that. I want to go deeper into the, the value of being different. And I want to get deeper into kind of like this. I think this is a really lovely example of like, you know, this underground race, like building a community from the ground up, right? Like we see stuff from the outside when it's at scale and we wonder how did it get there? And you're talking about like, this is getting there, but it's the early days. But I also want to set the stage with like who you are and what you do. So can you tell us about you and tell us about um, 3.4 media and just kind of like, what's, what's the story? Where are you guys at? How should people think about it? Yeah, for sure. So I started out, I was a freelance journalist for the first 10 or 15 years of my career. I did a lot of soccer writing. I did a lot of culture writing, did a lot of media writing. And I had a couple staff jobs for a year or so, but pretty much mostly just freelanced um, from 2005 to 2017 or so. And I still do a little freelance. I still write for ESPN and the Washington Post occasionally about like once a month or so. But four or five, I guess five or six years ago, uh, I started talking to a freelance friend of mine named Bill Bradley, who is not the senator or the basketball player, but is a <laughs> lovely, lovely person from the Midwest um, and, a, and a wonderful writer. And he had worked at Vanity Fair and The Daily, which was the um, News Corp iPad newspaper. I don't know if you remember that yep, from I remember a, that, a yep. long time ago that um, f failed miserably, but had some, had some fun while they were doing it. So he was freelancing as well and was a big runner. And we would run loops in Prospect Park, um, which is near our houses in Brooklyn, and talking about, you know, sort of the the money that we were making freelance writing increasingly was coming from doing editorial content for brands, you know, so like something like Airbnb's magazine or, um, you know, I guess in-flight magazines are sort of kind of on the border of that sort of thing. But even like a company like Dropbox or a lot of these tech companies have their own publications. Um, Mel Magazine, the, the Dollar Shave Club did Mel Magazine. So there are all these sort of examples of kind of sponsored content in whatever you kind of want to make that, whether that was, you know, Ford was working with Vanity Fair to produce a bunch of articles about yeah. the best 10 road trips and oh if you're going to do that like why don't you take your new Ford on one of these road trips you know um, and it just kind of felt like that was a space that was growing and also there was a increasing appetite I would say for stuff that was higher quality um, there's there's always sort of the downstream like you know SEO kind of low effort low AI touch content like, today. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Um, yeah. there's always that but it felt like there was an understanding from 
not every brand, but some brands that uh, consumers wanted to read stuff that was better and that, that would that would help their business, maybe not with a direct kind of ROI, but with the brand building stuff. Um, and so we got talking about that and decided to start a company, uh, and that's 3.4 Media, where we specialize in that and that's using, you know, the skills we learned as journalists, the writing, the reporting, the thinking about how to tell stories, the thinking about how to tell stories for different audiences. You know, I would write a story about the U.S. men's national soccer team very differently for the New York Times versus ESPN versus a soccer niche publication. And that's the thing you learn how to do as a journalist. Can you go deeper on that? Because, like, I I feel like that's something that seems obvious to you. Actually, I also wanted to say when you said write occasionally for the Washington Post, like, once a month, I was like, oh, my God. Like, I would, <laughs> I would love to have a book once a month. That's insane. Uh, but just wanted to just get that in there. But when can you go, like, a little bit deeper, <laughs> deeper, just, just expressing my jealousy. Um, like, if you can go a little bit deeper on, like, the difference between, like, the New York Times and the Post and, like, the niche. I, the niche soccer one seems, like, more different to me, but mm -hmm. I, like, what does that actually mean? Like, how different are they? Like, from somebody who's actually in their writing, thinking sure. about it, like, what, what does that look like? How is it actually different? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two, two parts to that answer. One is, what is the story pitch that an editor will accept, right? Because ESPN, they have, like, kind of an almost unlimited to some extent content need for sports content right like yeah. they are they are a soccer site the new york times less so now a little bit because of the digital then they don't have to fit it in the paper but if you have yeah. something like a print magazine or a print paper or, or even a, a digital you know newspaper they have less capacity for every individual story type um, you know, to the point where I wrote a story about squash for the New York Times one time and it was great. And then I had another story like three or four months later that was, I, I think, equally great. And I pitched them and the editor was basically like, we did our squash story for the year. You know, like we can't we can't do another squash story. Um, yeah. So I, I, there is kind of a limiting factor in the, the type of story that you pitch, like a, a story for the New York Times has to be. Um, it needs to have a bigger name. It needs to have frequently, you know, you're not going to do a profile of an up and coming MLS player who's going to play for the U.S. men's national team for ESPN. Like you're going to, or sorry, for the New York Times, you're going to do, that's going to have to be about, you know, Christian Pulisic, who's the, the biggest name in the U.S. team or like one of the top names. Otherwise, people aren't going to care. Um, so it's that. And then once you start writing the story, it's just it's just assumed knowledge. Like there's things writing for ESPN that you don't need to, that you can assume people understand. It's a more um, sports educated audience. Like it's not a more educated audience yeah. overall than the New York Times audience. They're, they're more fluent in thing, in soccer terminology and kind of what you need to explain. And how important is that assumed audience piece for somebody who's trying to get their, like, you know, let's go back to the branded content you're talking about. You're seeing this big shift. We see the exact same thing. You know, we're talking, I want to get into the like owned media versus earned media and what that looks like. But how important is it for folks if they're trying to write something and let's say they think they're doing a good job, but it's not connecting. Like, do you think that assumed audience and getting that wrong of like the knowledge of your audience is one of the reasons why sometimes like you write something that doesn't take off or doesn't connect or because I, I haven't really heard that term before. It makes perfect sense to me as like, of, of course, like someone who is very deep in the funnel at Wistia, I'm going to expect them to know a lot more about Wistia. Sure. But in terms of like content we're publishing out in the world, it can be really hard. Like, you know, especially if you're putting on social media, like if right. your main place that you're publishing is LinkedIn, it's like, what should I assume? You know, how specific or general do I need to be? So tell us, tell the, the listeners a little bit more about that and how to think about that. Yeah. I mean, I think knowing your audience is always important, right? I, th I think it's very hard to figure out kind of exactly what people know and what they don't know. And I actually think not to be super self promotion -y, but I think in some ways that's where we're really helpful or companies like us where they, we can come in and ask questions and help you kind of figure out your audience because like, one of the reasons that you're successful at Wistia is because you know the business of Wistia so well and you know the company so well. And because of that, you sort of have intuited all of these things that you don't even think about that someone who's coming in from the outside wouldn't know. It's just so second nature to you. And having someone come in 
and kind of ask you questions about what you're trying to say really helps tease out those things that can be sort of glossed over. Um, I think the example from our side is when we first started explaining sort of what we would do to companies and how we would work, we would just kind of be like, yeah, we, you know, we'll inter you know, if we're doing a piece of thought leadership, you'd be like, well, we, you know, we talk to you for half an hour and then we'll write the piece and then you'll have it. And yeah. like, <laughs> that skips so many steps <laughs> yeah. for someone who's never done that before. Right. But for us, it's like, that's the process is we talk to, and, but we don't mention that, you know, we will research beforehand the person we're talking to and stuff that they've written in the past and a little bit about, you know, what we're going to do and where the thought piece of thought leadership is going to go. And so there's all these steps that we skipped because we're trying to, you know, get the person not to be intimidated by the amount of time that it's going to take. Um, and, and I think we have sort of since realized that we need to be a lot more pro programmatic about how we talk about our process because people who are not involved intimately in the process don't know that and don't know all the work that goes into it. And so I think there's sort of talking around this point a little bit, but it's really hard to know your audience if you're so from the, from the ground, from the inside, it's, it's helpful sometimes to be able to pull out and like, you can do that on your own, but you have to do it very consciously and just sort of think about, okay, if I was going to read this and I didn't know anything about Wistia or I knew, you know, a little bit about Wistia, what are the things that someone that I wouldn't need to be explained to me and what would I need to have explained? That's very cool. And I mean, it makes sense that you approach it that way. And I can see how, you know, it's as you were saying that I was thinking to myself, like, I know this, I've done this a long time, but there's lots of new people who join and they don't have that context. And how do you get that context? And internally, it's like trying to have the brand voice written down and trying to have all these like, you know, like codes and cheat, cheat codes really yeah. to try to make it easier to do. But it's, it's still very hard to get right. And I think it is one thing on your site and a different thing when it's like snippets of it that are being shared out in the world or in different forms of media and stuff. Um, so I want to actually go to that. So you talked about how SEO is changing. Let's go a little bit deeper on like this, like owned media or earning it versus renting it. Like we've seen that trend, but you must have seen that in a big way to actually decide like, Hey, I'm going to start a business around this. Yeah. I mean, it just, it felt like, you know, that that was a thing that, that was becoming more and more popular and the other piece of it was, you know, as the writer, you're so far downstream from everything. Like, you know, if I'm writing an article, if I'm writing the four greatest, you know, 10 greatest road trips or whatever, like that's one piece of a, like Ford is not going to Condé Nast and being like, we want one piece of content about 10 great road trips. They're going to Condé yeah. Nast and they're saying, you know, we're going to buy four ads in your magazines. We want three videos, we want 10 pieces of content. You know, we want 10 pieces of written content. Um, and Bill and I got together and just sort of thought like one of the reasons we were good at freelance writing is we were good at the business side. We were good at sort of client relations, the emailing, the reaching out, the responsibility part that a lot of creative people don't want to do. And so we figured we could kind of go up stream a little bit and be the editors and then farm out the creative stuff, you know, whether that was writing or designing or developing. But yeah, I think it was just this understanding over the past, you know, five to 10 years of businesses and brands realizing how valuable creating that one-to-one -one connection is with content and how, you know, there's a lot of appetite for that. I think as, especially as the sort of more traditional media world falls apart, um, there's also some of you know, as celebrities need traditional publications less and less, they can partner with brands in ways to tell stories where they have more control over it. Um, and I think that's an interesting part to, I think, Drive to Survive, which I think we've, we both have watched and, and enjoyed it in some parts yeah. is a good example of that, of, you know, and there's a lot of, all of these places are realizing that they can really control the narratives in ways um, and, the key is understanding how to tell stories and the medium will kind of figure itself out. Is the messy deal part of this, like it, the same trajectory in terms of like, you are going to know more details on this than me. So just correct me. But my understanding sure. is like part of him switching to the MLS, right? Is like, he's getting a share of revenue, I think from like Apple TV and a bunch of other sources and like the d very direct relationship with one athlete. Is that correct? And is that the same idea of like celebrities being able to pick the media they're working with and like have more influence and like more upside and stuff? I think, I think so. I think Messi is such a unique case. I mean, it happened with David Beckham too, where they sort of 
gave him a franchise in MLS when he retired. And so, you know, if you have a transcendent, not even, I mean, Beckham was a transcendent celebrity. I think Messi is a transcendent talent who, because like Messi doesn't, Messi's very shy. He doesn't want to do media stuff, but he just does because he's so much better than him and he has to. Um, yeah. I think the interesting thing about the Apple deal is that the Apple deal, as far as I know, it's the first deal for a league where the rights are worldwide. So like the okay. English Premier League, you know, they have NBC broadcast them in the US. Sky, I think, broadcast them in England. Like they have all of these deals all over the world. The Apple one is only is MLS worldwide. And so the 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 business case for bringing in Messi is Messi's obviously a big star here, but he's also a huge star everywhere else. And so if yeah. you're trying to sell subscriptions to MLS's service on Apple Plus, like he is a transcendent athlete and i believe that his compensation at least as far as the apple stuff is is tied much more closely to international subscription revenue than u.s subscription revenue um and so i think that's kind of an interesting angle of that to see if that works out it, it, it seems to me that apple is using mls as kind of a test case for its rights deals and i would imagine you know amazon and netflix and all the rest of them are looking at it to see if it works out it just seems so different than where anything was like 10 years ago. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it was, it's something that it wouldn't have worked 10 years ago. The, in, the infrastructure wasn't there. Um, yeah. Still not entirely sure that the infrastructure is there in MLS to sustain and support Messi, but we'll see, you know, if, yeah, it's, no, if it's, it's going to work, cool it's going to work. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, so we're going a little high level talking about how this stuff works. Let's, let's ground it in when a company is deciding back to the branded content, okay, we're going to ramp up our content strategy. How, what is it? What does a good content strategy look like? What does a great content strategy look like? How should they think about that? How do you define that? How do you start? If you're, if you know, you need to do this, if you know, you need to build your own media of some form, how do you get going and how do you build a strong strategy? I think the first thing is that understand it's going to take time. Like this is the kind of thing that you can't do over. I mean, you can do content overnight. You will not see the return on it overnight. Um, it's it's a slow build. I think you really do need to think about who your audience is and what they're looking for. Um, you know, I, I think it's like anything though. It's you sort of do a comparative audit, see who else is out there. Um, I think a lot of companies kind of try to chase things quickly and like you know everyone kind of spins up a podcast this is a wonderful podcast but it, you know it's like you people see people see things and this is and you've you know, like really committed to this and, and it's great um but like it's pretty easy to kind of see oh like everyone has a podcast so we need a podcast too and then i think commitment i think is is a key thing like you have to get buy-in from the top level and if you're not gonna if you're not gonna do it and you're not gonna commit to it it's not worth it it like you might as well just light the money on fire because it's not it's not gonna work um <laughs> And I, I think it's much better to do, you know, not mincing words. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, that would be fun. You could do like a content series where you just lit money on fire. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's right, actually, that'd be fun. Um, I'd love to see that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, but I, I think it's better to do one or two things well than a bunch of things poorly, you know, and you can figure out what works. I think there's a lot of. There's a lot of repurposing too, which I think is smart. You know, I like mean, even doing this for video and video and audio, and like just little things like that. But it takes more investment to do the video stuff. It so you know, if if you're trying to cheap it out, it's not going to work. I think it's hard because it's there's sort of general principles that you can do, but I think every company is so different that it's hard to be like here's here's sort of the playbook for for content. The competitive audit is interesting. Do you like, do you find interesting stuff when you're doing that of like people not being aware that of what, who they're competing with or, um, you know, opportunities that seem good that are actually bad or like you said that is kind of an obvious thing, but I'm not even sure everyone does it. So like, yeah, what kinds of stuff have you found doing competitive audits? I, I think it's, I think one thing that the competitive audit helps do is it helps like we say content. And like content doesn't really mean anything, right? Like it, or it could mean 1 million different things. And so I think having a sense of what other people are doing in that space, in your space, either lets you lean into that if it seems like it's working or lean somewhere else. If you can see an opening in somewhere where they're not doing it, you know? Um, and I think it can be as simple as like, you know, having bespoke design and stuff like that really helps having um 
you know, not using clip art. Like people can tell if it's cheap and if it's bad. Consumers are pretty advanced in their thinking and their understanding of what they're reading and um, are constantly assaulted by garbage. And I think if you can do stuff that's less garbage, like that's really a, a, a big advantage um, as well. So do less garbage. Exactly. <laughs> Put yeah. the garbage out, but do light, do light the money on fire less. and do less garbage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the lines between media and commerce are blurred. I feel like more than ever. How do you think that's impacted the content strategy space? Like, what should people be paying attention to today? That's a good question. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like all of this content marketing is in service of selling stuff, right? So that is something that has changed, I guess. I think another thing going back to the content audit kind of stuff is how directly salesy you want to be and how hard you want to push that is is an important thing to think about and kind of figure out what those lines are and if you're doing different kinds of content maybe each you know different kinds of content types have different sort of direct push sales and the answer is always the sales people are going to want to push the sales harder and the content people are generally going to not want to not do that um so i think you kind of walk a balance there but i always think about it as sort of the like what's your kind of content cinematic universe right and like we work for a company that it, it's a venture company and they do it's a nonprofit venture firm and we run they have an editorial platform hmm. and you know so we have we have stories that are directly like interviews with CEOs of companies that they have invested in and that's you know the, the the point of this is not the point of their thing is not to sell stuff but like they are kind of selling the companies and trying to draw press and so that's like the most direct salesy stuff that we do right but then there's also We'll do roundtables with, you know, maybe a CEO from one of their portfolio companies and then three or four other people who are in the similar space. And they'll all talk about issues that are in the, you know, f food desert space or something like that. Um, and then they do a lot of stuff about women's health. And so when Roe v. Wade um, was overturned, we did a package on a handful of stories where we talked to people who are providing abortion access and women's health access, some of the companies that they had invested in, some people who were just in the space. And uh, I think that was a really successful way of, you know, drawing attention to a pretty important issue and also, you know, being able to include people who were important in this groups in the nonprofits world, but in a non aggressive sales way of just sort of like these these people are, are experts in their field and then sometimes we just do like interviews with people who are interesting as sort of if we can get a big name we have a um kind of like the proust questionnaire for vanity fair we just have 25 questions that we ask this we you know the same 25 questions that we ask these people and so it's like that's kind of the the big name it's like well you don't want to do we don't want to take too much of their time they don't want to do anything sort of super in-depth or anything that could be kind of scary but like if you can just answer these questions and we'll get a sense of you and there are questions that are tailored sort of towards the venture nonprofit space, but also trying to be a little interesting. Um, not that it's not interesting, but to like, you know, el elicit some interesting responses from these people. And so that's, you know, that's the stuff that is maybe a little sexier be just because it's a big name. So I kind of think about all of these different, like, you know, planets within the universe, um, or I don't know, maybe, maybe the better, for, better metaphor is like rings around Saturn or something like that. As you get, you get kind of closer and closer to, you know, the, the mothership of the company that you're working for, you know, it's not just like one kind of bucket of content. It's like a lot of different things. Piggybacking kind of off of what Chris said, and then something you said earlier, which is that like customers are smarter, maybe smarter than they've ever been. It seems like they want to be sold to less so like what does content strategy do if you're not doing like the super selly stuff i mean I, I think on one hand it's just a it's an awareness battle you know a point of you see a advertisement on tv and it doesn't really directly sell someone in some ways or you know or like the geico jingle or any of that stuff it's like that's not really designed to sell immediately it's designed to kind of if i need insurance in the future go out and get geico um so i, I think that's one answer um i think also there's a real value in being a brand that can 
entertain or, you know, keep someone interested or be charming or do something along those lines. Like I, you know, there's no direct correlation, I wouldn't say, but certainly people who have fond feelings for brands, I'm sure are more likely to purchase things from them or recommend them, you know, we, and there's so much garbage out there too that I think being able to be an authority or just like somebody who's a company that is charming and well thought of is really valuable I think the the point in there that's really interesting is like you know sometimes people say what's the ROI of all this content you guys are making or like what's the point but there's a simple thing you said in there around hey if there's a, a brand that's more charming or a brand that's more entertaining that can be enough. <laughs> and I yeah. think that that's like often missed. That's like, if you have affinity for a brand, if you have a connection to them, that's going to win. If you're trying to, it's going to better cement a memory, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's going to make you more likely to recall a specific brand. But if you're picking between two and you have one of them is more entertaining and the other one is not, and they're basically the same. Otherwise you're going to go with that. It's, it's almost too simple. It's like shockingly simple hard to do actually in reality right like actually making a brand have something that people care about right is hard yeah i mean i think going back to the beginning i think that race is a great example you know i mean this is a objectively ridiculous thing to do to go run 10 and a half miles through the streets of manhattan at at eight o'clock at night but i had seen this pop up in my instagram feed you know i follow them on instagram and and i think i only follow them because they popped up on someone else's they did a race and they were like this is great and so i started following them and then you know a year later i'm running this from giving them 50 dollars to go run this race and you know there's a lot of running groups in new york whose races i could be running but this one is has a nice like i like the sort of aggressive kind of bandit pirate ethos that they have established (laughs) and it seemed like a good group of people and so then I'm there and you know that's a choice that I made Uh, there were probably half a dozen races I could have run on that Saturday if I felt like it from all kinds of different groups Um, but I went with them because that's a choice and yeah I think too if you're trying if you want to buy something and then you and you google you know what's the best whatever then you just get flooded. There's, there's such a problem with review sites online now. And, you know, the, everyone goes to the wire cutter and the wire cutter is great, but doesn't have everything. And also maybe <laughs> you don't trust it. They steered me wrong and, a couple of times. Yeah, just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm just you saying, know, I, I bought some pillows. <laughs> <laughs> I returned those pillows. <laughs> yeah. And so I think if you have, you know, if you have a connection to this brand through, it's kind of like being influenced rather than by an influencer, but by the brand itself, which is sort of the whole point of influencing to begin with, you know, and then the issue there is, does the quality hold up? And I, that's a separate problem to have than, you know, someone's not buying my stuff. So that makes perfect sense to me. And I, I think about that in the same way. And I also think and this funny thing in like B2B, which is like, you know, B2C, it's easy to think of like, all right, you find your influencer who... Okay goes and talks about this thing and then they like have their like it's like lifestyle brand that now they're drinking uh liquid death and now everyone's drinking liquid death like it's it's harder to do that in b2b because the influencers are often like the people at the companies right Mm -hmm. so it seems like the content and the brand as the influencer is what you're trying to aspire to do but you need depth right like you can't you have to tell a lot of stories you can't tell one and it has to actually be entertaining or it has to be, I just keep going back to different. Like it has to be different. You want different results. You got to be different. Yeah. Maybe the same as everybody else is going to be the same. And I, and it's hard to actually do that. Yeah, I think so. I think we've had some success of doing, you know, eBooks or white papers that target specific audiences that a company is trying to attract and kind of trends. We did a book, uh, we did one last year as an eBook and it was for a tech company and they one of their kind of client segments is hr professionals and so we did a whole ebook and we you know talked to a bunch of professionals like hr experts and talked to them about trends that were happening in the hr space and did a bunch of graphics and design and stuff like that and then in the ebook worked in like oh if you're trying to do this kind of thing like you can use this company's product to do this and i think stuff like that is is pretty helpful and pretty effective um and to your point it's not you know that was not targeted at ceos of major companies that was targeted at the decision makers who are going to be figuring out what kind of hr 
software their company needs, you know? And so if you can get to those people, then they can go up the food chain at their company and be like, well, we need to use this and we need to give this company, you know, a hundred thousand dollars for this, this software, because that's, you know, this, this is great for X, Y, and Z reasons. Do you guys think there's going to be a new, how do I say it? Like a new metric that like content strategists are paying attention to, or like, it just seems very hard to quantify awareness right like and yet you see how invaluable it is today so like i don't know if i see wistia is doing a new series and then i go to your landing page and i'm like wow wistia is a cool company that's great it's not like a sale like how how do you think people are going to think about metrics when it comes to content strategy in the future i'm sure there'll be a new number new metric because there's always new metrics and new numbers but you know I, i to me it would be I would try to find something specific to my company or what I was trying to do rather than something more general. And I I don't know exactly what that is or how realistic that is for, especially for smaller companies, but it it feels to me that there's so much noise out there and very little signal. And I think I would try to find something that was important to me as a company and just sort of optimize for that or have maybe have a couple of those things and that would be kind of my north star for what i was trying to do with the content and whether that was you know just getting people to the site or whatever or i mean maybe it was just revenues going up every quarter like that's great like i don't think you're going to be able to measure it so directly in terms of the the uh seo expert on a couple of weeks months ago and you know he was great about just talking about how specific that used to be it was like you paid two dollars for this keyword and you got right. five dollars back totally. like that that's yeah. not gonna happen anymore yeah um that's that's yeah that's, that's what that's i thought a, of when yeah. you said that is yeah. like it used to be right? <laughs> like this is exactly how much traffic you're getting for this exact thing and here are the keywords and up oh, i understand the full connection and it's getting more and more obfuscated and harder and harder to tell and then it's funny too because like you'll make stuff and you'll like at least for me it's been looking at like engagement numbers. So like how much are people responding and like how much do they connect with something? But often that's on other platforms. And so it's shifted more and more as people spend their time differently. You have to build your brand, I think more in other places and other snippets, like, right? Like selections of this show will be seen more on different platforms than the whole episode by itself. And so we have to go look at all that and see if people are responding. And, you know, and I, and I, it's hard to say, I think what it's going to be, in the future because everyone wants to control their own metrics like on all these platforms too right uh so that they're not getting gamed and stuff so yeah it's an interesting it's an interesting time but actually uh, it's funny it, it, it makes me think about like this is how it all used to be <laughs> right this was it this was it it was just like so it's yeah. like how many people get the new york times that's your number right. like you don't know like how many people are reading each story and there's a weird part of that for me that's like actually really exciting because it makes me think like oh if you have taste and you have an understanding of quality that's actually more of an advantage again versus a world where you can track every single thing it's like um it's it's that that innate advantage goes away you know right yeah yeah i, I think that's very true um marketing teams they're gonna have to spend their marketing budget somewhere you know and and i think that that is another thing that's encouraging and people are going to want to take chances and do interesting things and i think if you're rewarded for it in eyeballs and things like that you know even if there's not kind of a direct financial correlation benefit they're going to get excited about that and marketing budgets aren't going to go to zero like the money still has to go somewhere and people have to spend something and if you can't do the easy thing which is just buy a keyword and get this amount of money then you probably have to get a little creative and and also you know i think there's a lot of lazy there's a lot of lazy companies and lazy businesses and lazy marketers and lazy content makers. And I think having a little separation for people who can do, do good things is actually going to be a real benefit to the people who can do the good things because the quality will really come through in a way that maybe it got lost or just, it didn't need to be so good in the past because it was a lot easier to just put X amount of money towards this thing and know you're going to get Y dollars out of it. It's totally true. Okay, I want to ask uh, another question that Sylvie's going to be like, why are you asking this question? I have to ask it. So um, 
Noah and I are in the same like signal group talking about F1. We both got into F1 because of Drive to Survive, as you're mm-hmm. talking about. But like for me, I've become like such an insane fan. I don't know why it's like connected with me in this way. And I and people are confused. They're like, Savage, why are you so obsessed with this? Like, why has this become your thing? And I think it's the stories in Drive to Survive. But you are someone who has written about so many different sports and been so in there. Like, do you agree or do you think there's something else going on? Or am I the outlier? Like, how do you think it is? Does F1 seem any special or different or is it the same as everything else? I it's just I happen to connect to these stories. I think that the first season of Drive to Survive did a really incredible job of like simplifying the sport in a way that anyone could follow from a sporting perspective. I I do think only having 20 athletes makes a big difference. Um, you know, I also watched the tennis one and which break point was, yeah, it was not my favorite. Um, and the golf one was okay. Um, I liked the tour de France one. I think the tour de France one, I, I think drive to survive also is and F1 generally is visual in a way that, a lot of American sports are not. And I think the tour de France has something similar to that. Like there's a lot of different worlds. Yeah. And there's a lot of like overhead drone shots where there'll be in some tiny little town in France and there'll be, you know, a traffic circle and like half the Peloton will go one way and half the Peloton will go the other way. And then they'll come back and it's just this beautiful flock of bird almost kind of thing, you know, where all the starlings like go this way and then they go that way. Yeah. I, I think seeing the sport that's so fast up close like that, is pretty cool um and the cameras are amazing and so i think you don't you know as as well done as the network coverage of f1 and tour de france is you don't ever kind of see it in that way um and i think that has been really cool to see but yeah i don't i don't know if there's anything kind of intrinsic to f1 of why people have gotten so it's just more that it's it's visual it's behind the scenes there's less you know yeah it's it feels like a very privileged look in at something that is very hard to understand or see otherwise. I, and I wonder if that's like, well, it's, I mean, it's kind of similar to the, what we're talking about with content marketing, which is like, you know, if you bring people behind the scenes and like, I guess knowing where the audience is at, right. And like knowing right. what they know is like what makes it allow them to make it like really compelling and interesting. Okay. Last section. This is our rapid fire segment. Let's go. So first question, what's the best article you've read this month? Best article I've read this month. Yeah, I read so many articles. Um, there's a really good article that I read this morning about uh, Larry Gagosian. I believe is how, how you pronounce his name. He's an art dealer, um, has 20 galleries around the world um, by Patrick Radin Keefe, who has written all these wonderful books. Um, and he spent a very long time with him. It's in The New Yorker. Uh, and it was a fascinating look at how he has pretty much single-handedly changed the world of being a gallery owner and now is astonishingly rich and is sort of one of the the rich people who could be buying the art if he was not uh selling it cool um what is the best tv show you have seen this summer i don't know if this entirely counts because it's the third season but the other two on hbo max so good the yeah. other two the other oh my two. god it's so funny i went i don't know it I went to um, see a a show last night at the Bell House called Middle-Aged Dad Jam Band. And they invited, like they had all these guests come up on stage and it was like basically the whole cast of the other two. Like, bro. I'm very jealous I missed that. Oh my God. It was very funny. Awesome. I have to check that out. Um, What is the best movie you've seen last year? I just saw Barbie on Friday and it was incredible. So I really liked Barbie. (laughs) <laughs> I, I really like John Wick 4 I think oh yeah would wow. probably uh, we have started going for big blockbuster movies to the Regal Cinemas in Essex Square and they have you know tickets are like $27 and far too expensive but don't have, tell they, anybody about that theater yeah it's, it's great it's the best kept secret they have recliners and the screens are Stop listening of, immediately, yeah. everyone. <laughs> uh, I would recommend that for every every blockbuster, but now we still are there. So, <laughs> um, all great content strategies should start with blank. Your audience. Perfect. Give me three words that define the future of branded content. Um, creative, 
thoughtful, caring. Oh, wow. That's, that's, sweet. that's so touching. That's yeah. so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Noah, thank you so much for coming on the show and for catching up. Where, where can people best connect with you to learn more? Um, we have a website, 3.4media.com, all spelled out, uh, no numbers. And uh, Noah at 3.4media.com is my email address. Awesome. Probably the best places. Perfect. Thank awesome. you. Thank you for coming to the show. Thank you for catching up. Thank you for bringing us into your story and breaking down Drive to Survive and all these things. Really appreciate <laughs> it. This has been great. Thanks so much. Noah, I mean, he's such a soft-spoken guy. And I love how he had to start by saying, he's just like, I don't really get loud, but I do I talk know. a lot. <laughs> You're going to know I'm excited when I'm talking a lot. And that was true. <laughs> yes. Very soft, but impassioned speaker. And, uh, you know, words are, words are his life. So it makes sense that his talking too loud is talking too much or yes, talking and I, a lot. And I liked a lot getting into the idea of like, you know, even how are you building a brand that's charming? How do you build a brand that's entertaining and like telling the stories to do that? Because sometimes we overcomplicate these things. They're kind of simple. It's like, we just want to connect with something and we want to feel, we want to feel like a brand matters to us. Right. And often it doesn't take that much to do it, but it does take taking some risks and it does take having an, an opinion and a voice, which, not everybody does. It's very, very easy to go the safe route and not and not have a voice. Yeah, it was interesting hearing him tell his own story and and sort of taking these learnings from being a journalist, from being a freelance writer and inject them into branded content, because like for journalists, for most writers, like you always want to tell a great story like it is that simple. And I think like, to your point, sometimes branded content misses that. They just miss mm -hmm. that, that you always just wanna be telling a great story. And it was, yeah, it was interesting how he kind of came into this field with that truth, right? And how he can then apply that to any content strategy really is, yeah, it's a win. I'm rambling. It's a win. It's a win, but it's it is, but actually doing it. I think that's the thing that people miss is it's like, I wrote a blog post about like this feature set I have. Okay. Like what's the story? Like what's the story in it that actually gets someone to care. And there always can be a story, right? Like I don't care if you're in B2B and your thing seems boring. Yeah. Right. There's always just, you're saving someone time. You're enabling them to do something they couldn't do. Otherwise you're helping them get promoted. You're helping them differentiate themselves. You're doing, you're doing something that actually matters to somebody. And it's just, how do you pull that story out and actually tell it? And that also, I guess it's like, that's the scary bit too, right? Like if you tell a real story, it doesn't connect, it feels scarier than if you list your features. <laughs> no, totally. It's, I think so many professions miss that. Like there is always a narrative. There's always like a way to thread that needle. And like, if you can find that, you're going to kick some butt. So crazy. Wow. Look at you, Sylvie. Kick some butt. You okay? <laughs> oh, I think that means it's time to wrap it up. It's time to wrap it up. Well, thank you for joining us here today at Talking Too Loud. Uh, if you want more interaction, more conversation, you can find both Sylvia and I on x.com. I have no um, words. But as we terrible, like to say, terrible storytelling. <laughs> we are both spending more time on LinkedIn these days, so find us there. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. It helps get the word out. You can always email us if you have ideas, voice memos, things you want on the air, ttlpod.com. That's it for us, and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.